data science is largely focused on acquisition and analysis, at least for now. How do you see art and creativity fitting in? Well, I see creativity being very important, but art would only be interesting if we change our definition of what art is. Art in the 20th century was pretty much defined by its total lack of any utility at all. Anything that had utility was not art. That doesn't interest me. We're interested in using technology and creativity for as much utility as possible to help people make better decisions. So creativity is certainly interesting. Art, not so much. But art, so the definition of art would need to expand to include utility, right? Well, it does. Uh, the definition of art changes all the time, and that's what's interesting. You know, you get very bored with the music your granddad listened to, and you want something new. So we think that the art of the 21st century will actually be defined by how useful it is. And from that standpoint, you could argue that the most important art so far has been things like Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. You have a session that looks at the intersection of uh, data and virtual reality. What role do you see VR playing in the future of data? Well, VR, in regard to the future of data, people need to understand that VR is not a better visualization system. It's a new communication system, totally new, that will allow you, uh, as it develops, to do anything that your smartphone or computer can do right now with communication. Uh, because VR is powered by the smartphone and the cell phone, but it also allows you to do much more beyond that, things that are not even possible to imagine within the systems that you're using right now. And so that if data is a digital system, essentially, it's ones and zeros. Any Hollywood movie or any computer game is the same ones and zeros. Data has been policed into a self-censoring view that the only way to present data is with bar charts mm. and graphs. And bar charts and graphs are a really, really terrible way to <laughs> communicate anything. That's true. So uh, a new communication platform, and those are actually the words of Mark Zuckerberg, who bought Oculus Rift for $2 billion. He wasn't buying a new way to play computer games. Right. He was buying a new way to communicate. Or a fancy new way to do bar charts. That probably wasn't on his mind. <laughs> How did you personally get involved in VR? What drew you to it? Well, I come from the film industry, and my team are all coming from film, interactive gaming. We're much more comfortable at Tribeca and Sundance than we are at a big data conference, but we've made the decision to apply our problem solving, our skill sets, our technology, what we know about what works and what doesn't work to the area of big data because we think that big data has the power to create a whole different kind of media experience that empowers people, that allows them to make decisions, take actions, that takes a couch potato and turns them into an activist. How do you see VR evolving in the short term, say over the next 18 to 24 months? It's almost like 18 to 24 minutes is the short term <laughs> for VR, to be perfectly frank. The, the pace of technological change is astounding. We made a film in April. We had to use 12 cameras and almost by hand stitch those images together to create a 360 image. You don't need to do that anymore. Those problems. That was April of this year. Yes, those problems have been fixed. VR is now the thing that's almost cracked right now is real time. So that means that you'll be able to watch the Super Bowl from lots of different 360 perspectives and uh, feel like you're actually on the field with the players. It's being used for coaching in sports right now. It's proven as a very effective medicine for PTSD. And it's even being called the empathy machine because it provokes really strong connections with the content that you're looking at. So 18 to 24 months is a very long time. 
in the, in such a rapid pace of development. In 18 to 24 months, the simple answer is VR will be everywhere and we'll not be doing this anymore or swiping and the cost is coming down to being, being essentially free at the lower end of mm -hmm. VR. So anything that's free and that's better, that turns your cell phone into an IMAX cinema, is quite likely to have a very big impact on a digital system and data is a digital system, it's not done on paper, it's a digital system so it's going to need to pay attention to something that's about to revolutionise digital media. So things like Google's Cardboard will bring it down to the point where virtually anybody can take advantage of it? Well you can get Google Cardboard for 20 bucks right now but Kellogg's the cereal mm -hmm. company just released a cereal box that you can make a VR headset. That's they great. released that in New Zealand yeah. this month, and that's very interesting. It's like Eric Smith said quite a few years ago that technology will disappear, and when technology doesn't cost anything, right. you can throw it in your school bag or write on it, or if it gets crushed, who cares? Buy another box of cereal. Right. It's there again. Right. That's super interesting. I mean. When you look at how simple pieces of technology can really change culture, you'd think of like the impact the boombox had mm -hmm. on music because it allowed people to you know, play around with the music for the first time, to hit play and record, mm -hmm. to start sampling, to start mixing. People forget that that's, that happened before DJing, before hip hop, and it had a huge effect on, on the music industry. Interesting. Uh, do you make a distinction between data and information? Do you see them as different things? Well, information, science sees them as different things. There's a popular diagram that lists a pyramid with data at the bottom, then information, then knowledge, then wisdom, mm -hmm. D-I-K-W. Mm -hmm. You read all about that. Lots of academics talk about it. It's very interesting that they never talk about wisdom. And we think VR gives us a chance to build a system in the wisdom area that then trickles down. Uh, so the difference is data is code without meaning. Information is adding meaning. And then knowledge stepping up from that so that you understand and wisdom. What's really interesting when you look at that pyramid again is that the bottom is the machines and the top is humans. Mm knowledge and wisdom are in the heads of your employees not in your hardware and but the system right now doesn't understand that's why they can't talk about wisdom because wisdom doesn't fit in a box wisdom is the consciousness of the people that work for you last question for you what people or projects are you following these days i'm following projects that are not trying to make a better movie in vr or a better game in vr they're trying to make VR in VR. You know, they're trying to like push the edges of the medium. For example, uh, Kareem Ben Khalifa just did a project called The Enemy, which puts you between two combatant fighters, one Israeli, one Palestinian, and you feel like you're there and you listen and people take the headset off and they're in floods of tears. Another project being Be Another, which uses VR and a camera to simulate the experience of like gender swapping, being in another person's body, a different race, an old person. They're using it for disabled people to work with dancers so that they can experience what it's like to move. These things are very powerful and uh, that's what inspires me. We're not talking about just going from a rectangle to a 360 orb. We're talking about something that really, really deeply impacts the humans who encounter it. So it's a paradigm shift. It's like the horse versus the car, in my opinion. It's not just the iPad versus the, the laptop. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Thank you.